Chapter 144, Seventh Year, Choices You fucking bastard! Ollie! Sirius was on his feet at once. It's, it's okay, Remus said, not sure who he was talking to. Sirius, who had leapt up in defence mode, or Marlene, sobbing and red-faced and angry. <laughs> bastard! She said again, defiantly, rubbing at her eyes. Miss McKinnon! Madame Pomfrey appeared, looking uncharacteristically flustered. I will have you escorted, if you cannot be civil. And you! Marlene turned on her. You said you didn't know anything about it. You said you'd never worked with one before. Don't blame her, Marlene, please. Remus said, sitting down on the bed again, feeling a bit woozy. She was only trying to protect me. How long? Marlene spun around and glared at him again. Since, since I was five. <sighs> Marlene, please. She flung a piece of parchment down on the bed. It was a letter, folded up and a bit dog-eared from all the fuss. Remus reached for it with his shaking hands. Marlene stood there, stone-faced, waiting for him to read it. He unfolded it and looked down and tried his hardest, most of the time now, he had no trouble at all reading, but he was still very tired and so nervous that all of a sudden he felt eleven years old again. The letters seemed to shift and change as he tried to make sense of them. Uh, sorry, he shook his head. Sorry, I've, I've got a headache. Oh, what, what does it... Uh... Sirius took it from him, and in doing so, placed himself conspicuously between Remus and Marlene. He cleared his throat, frowning. <clears throat> it's from Danny McKinnon. Bloody hell, Mooney! What have you done? Please just tell me what it says. Rima shook his head, leaning forward and cradling his forehead in his hands. He really was getting a headache now. Marlene was tapping her foot impatiently, and Madame Pomfrey was still hovering, obviously unsure whether or not to pull rank on this whole situation. Sirius scanned the page, much more comfortable with all the attention. He says, thank you, he said. What? Remus looked up, squinting. Well, that's the gist, Sirius replied, still reading. He received a letter when he arrived home this morning from one of Marlene's friends, who claims to be a werewolf. It had lots of useful advice, and he'd like to meet you. He says he won't tell anybody, and he has no idea who you are anyway. But I do, Marlene said. She had stopped crying now, and her voice was a bit calmer. But Remus could feel the heat of emotion radiating from her. Yeah, Remus nodded, his neck stiff. I knew you'd work it out. And you sent the letter anyway, she faltered for a moment. I wanted to help, he shrugged. There was a long pause. Remus would have liked to lie down but felt that it wouldn't be well received. Dumbledore knows, and McGonagall. Marlene was speaking much more quietly now, as if she could hardly believe it. Yes. It's so dangerous, she whispered. You could have killed someone. No, Sirius said, hands on his hips. It's all been perfectly safe ever since first year, hasn't it, Poppy? Remus would never hurt anyone. Remus wouldn't. Marlene met his eyes. But the wolf might. I haven't. Not ever. Remus felt the need to confirm. We've done everything possible. Are you registered? She snapped. What? Uh, almost everything possible. He conceded. And you... You just wanted to help Danny. You, you weren't trying to... I don't know, get him on side? What side are you talking about, McKinnon? Sirius stepped forward threateningly. Mooney's on our side. He's your friend. I thought he was, Marlene replied. She wasn't afraid of Sirius. She could best him on the Quidditch pitch any day, and Madame Pomfrey was standing right there. I had to keep it secret, Marlene, Remus pleaded, the tension too unbearable. I had to, otherwise 
I could never have come to Hogwarts at all. You know what it's like when there's something different about you. You know what people are like. He met her eye as he said this, and saw her tone cold with fear as it dawned on her exactly what he was alluding to. How dare you, she said. How dare you? No, I I didn't mean... He held his hands up, but it was too late. Stay away from my family, she snapped, before turning on her heel and storming away, in much the same way she had arrived. Remus exhaled. He didn't really feel afraid, though he had no idea what Marlene planned to do next. He wondered vaguely if he could do his newts exams by correspondence, or if the Potters would let him stay at theirs without James and Sirius being there. But his head was too much of a muddle to make a proper plan, and he thought he'd rather just get some sleep while he could. He lay back down on the bed, Madame Pomfrey and Sirius watching him. I'm okay, he said. Honestly. Just gonna have a little rest. I'm going to speak to Professor McGonagall at once, Madame Pomfrey said finally. I think, Remus said sleepily, closing his eyes. You might be better off talking to Marlene, once she's calmed down. She respects your opinion. Don't get her in trouble. She hasn't done anything wrong. Madame Pomfrey gave him a very soft look, then came over to smooth his bed sheets a bit, touching his hand gently before leaving. Hasn't done anything wrong, Sirius muttered, scuffing his feet against the flagstone floor. She's being a bigoted little cow. It's not an uncommon point of view, Remus sighed. Uh, I might as well get used to it sometime. I ought to go and... No, Remus said sharply. Leave her alone. But she's going to... She's going to talk to her friends first, Remus said firmly. Lily and Mary. I'd rather she talk to them. They're the best people in this situation. He yawned. Bloody hell, Mooney. Sirius shook his head. How can you be so calm? Oh, I'm knackered. Remus replied, and it was the last thing he said for hours. The thing was, whichever way it went, Remus couldn't see much of a future for himself at Hogwarts anyway. He was grateful, obviously, for everything Dumbledore, McGonagall and Madame Pomfrey had done for him. He'd loved every one of his subjects, except potions, maybe, and above all, he had a group of friends who were dearer to him than any family could ever be. But the good things would stay good, if he had to go. He might have more time to spend with hope, more time to dedicate to winning this terrible war. Remus was no longer really learning anything at school that he hadn't already got from books. He yearned for practical experience. He wanted to be truly tested. He didn't need newts for that, just a well-stocked library and enough nerve. Remus had everything he needed now to do the thing he had wanted to do almost all his life. If Marlene got him dismissed from school, then Remus was finally free to seek out Greyback. The idea had been ticking away ever since he learnt the werewolf's name, and that night he'd written to Danny, everything seemed very clear. It was the thing he was born to do, almost as if he had inherited the task from Lyle. Gawky, insignificant, second-class Remus Lupin was never going to bring anyone down so insidiously terrible and all-powerful as Lord Voldemort. But the wolf in him knew he might have a chance at Fenrir Greyback. Remus knew it might kill him, but he was bloody well going to do some damage first. He'd said nothing to Sirius about this. As far as they'd come together, Remus was deeply ashamed of his own desire for revenge, his inability to tame that reckless rage. Sirius looked to him for self-control, for a reasonable, measured response and Remus wasn't about to shatter that illusion and risk ruining everything that worked about their dynamic. Anyway, Remus was 18 now, and muggle or wizard, he could make choices for himself, no matter how dangerous. And if it took upsetting Marlene to kick everything off, then at least he'd been able to help her brother in some small way. One of Matron's fatalistic catchphrases popped into his head then. No good deed goes unpunished! Though, what good deeds Matron had ever done, he didn't know. 
It was dinner time when he woke for the second time that day. Sirius wasn't there anymore, but the Marauder's map was tucked under Remus's pillow. He withdrew it and saw that the Marauders were all in the common room, Mary and Lily close by. There was a chicken pie on a plate by his bedside, magically kept warm somehow. Remus hadn't worked it out yet. Maybe a charm on the plate. He decided he would eat before anything else, and did so in silence, thinking at a mile a minute, as if his brain was making up for all the time he'd wasted sleeping. He scanned the map for Marlene. She was in the girls' dorm, with Yaz. He didn't know if that was good or bad. No angry mobs had come by brandishing pitchforks yet, which was probably a good sign. Madame Pomfrey came over just as he was finishing his second slice of millionaire shortbread. The thick, oozy caramel was very comforting. "'How are you feeling, dear?' she asked, deep frown lines in her face. "'Fine,' he said brightly. He held out the plate to her. "'Want one? I'll never eat them all.' This was a lie, and they both knew it, but Madame Pomfrey was polite enough to go along with him. "'Well, as there's no one else on the ward today,' she smiled, sitting in the chair beside him and accepting a sweet. She conjured up two saucers, then poured hot, steaming tea from her wand. It was all very pleasant, but Remus could feel a big talk coming on. "'I'll go after this,' he said. "'Get out of your hair.' "'You're never any trouble, Remus,' she replied kindly, blowing on her tea to cool it. "'Even when you were a little boy.' I was a right little git in first year, Remus countered. She smiled and shook her head. Oh, not at all. A diamond in the rough. Oh, he said, feeling himself heat up. Anyone else he'd have told to shut up or piss off. But he would never, ever have a rude word to say to Madame Pomfrey. It's flown by the last few years, she sighed. I remember that little scrap of a thing you were, all eyes and elbows. You've grown into a very fine young man. He wished he'd stop, as nice as all of this was. He didn't know what to do with it. And you deserve every success, Remus. Do you hear me? She continued. It's not going to be easy for you after school. And I know you know that. He nodded. I'll be okay. You will, she smiled, her eyes brightening with tears. And if you ever need anything, you know where to reach me. Of course. I knew Danny McKinnon, you know, she said, clearing her throat. Here it comes, Remus thought. But she'd cunningly overpowered him with all that nice stuff, and he just had to grit his teeth and listen now. Yeah, he said casually, taking another slice of cake. Yes, when he was a student here. I had him in here hundreds of times for patching up. He was a Gryffindor beater, like Marlene. He was a bit more outgoing than she is. Mm, I don't know, Remus returned dryly. She's hardly a shrink in Violet. Madame Pomfrey smirked despite herself. No, quite. She has that McKinnon tenacity and a keen sense of right and wrong. She does, he sighed. He'd always liked that about Marlene, her straightforwardness. And I know what you're going to say, that everything isn't that simple, that there are shades of grey, and it doesn't matter what people think about you, it matters what you do. Well, yes. And I know all of that, and it's fine. I knew all of that when I wrote to Danny. I even know how Marlene would react. But... In the end, it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was helping him. I'm proud of you, Remus. That threw him for a loop. His throat constricted, and he almost choked trying to swallow the last of his slice, the sugar turning to acid on its way down. He spluttered and coughed, reaching for the tea to wash it down. Madame Pomfrey got up, smiling. She patted him on the shoulder as he recovered. I'll let you get on. He took a few moments to compose himself before getting up. He brushed the crumbs from the sheets and made the bed. 
though he knew he didn't really need to. The rest of the sweets he wrapped up into some parchment and carefully slid the package into his bag. He might need them later. Remus was almost surprised by how calm he felt. There was such a sense of closing, of coming to an inevitable end. Someone was always going to find out, he told himself. He'd have been an idiot to think that they could all hide such a big thing forever. But they'd done a bloody good job. It had all been luck, and they'd taken so many risks. At least this way, it had been Remus's choice. He'd controlled it as much as he could. This way, the marauders were safe too. No one would know what they'd all been up to every full moon. He made his way slowly back to Gryffindor Tower. He was all stiff from sleeping all day, and was grateful for the opportunity to stretch his legs in privacy. Sirius hadn't mentioned the hip problem for a while, but Remus saw him purse his lips or frown whenever he noticed Remus limping or rubbing his side. Blutherskite, he said to the fat lady, who barely looked up from filing her nails to let him through. He entered the room and felt six pairs of eyes on him at once, steeling himself and pasting on a careless smile. He approached his friends, sitting in their usual place, taking up two sofas and an armchair. Mooney! Cyrus got up from where he'd been sprawling to make room. I was just going to come up and see if you were awake. I'm awake, he said redundantly, taking his seat. Sirius told us what you did, Peter said, as if he couldn't contain himself. He was fiddling with a chess piece. There was a game going on but Remus couldn't tell who Peter was playing. Good, Remus nodded. Uh, anyone spoken to Marlene? We got yelled at, Mary sighed, indicating herself and Lily. I think she's mostly hurt that she was the last one to find out. Hmm. She's not said much else, though, being locked away with Yaz. Right. Listen, Mooney. James leaned over, eyes very serious. We've been talking. And remember fifth year. Dumbledore stopped Snape from telling anyone. He can stop Marlene too, if it comes to that. He might. Remus nodded, though he wasn't so sure. He might serve Dumbledore better out of school now than he could have at sixteen. Especially considering the contacts Remus had already made. But leave him out of it for now. Why did you do it? Peter asked, still clutching the chess piece. To help Danny, Remus replied, surprised. He looked at them all. He was alone. No one was helping him. Marlene told me that herself. But Remus, Lily said, you knew how she would feel about it. You knew she wouldn't understand. I knew that, but it was for Danny. Remus repeated firmly. They all promised to give it time and see what Marlene decided to do next. Lily and Mary vowed that they would do everything they could that night in their dorm. They would explain, try to convince her. Remus thanked them because he knew how much they cared about him. They had a quiet evening. Remus played chess with Peter and lost. Then Sirius took over and they tied. James and Lily quizzed each other on potion ingredients and Mary half-heartedly worked on job applications. Oh, half-boring muggle secretarial stuff to please Mum, and half-boring Ministry of Magic stuff to please McGonagall, she sighed. Eventually, they went to bed, one by one. And though Remus had barely been awake for three hours that day, he climbed the stairs yawning. Sirius had been very patient. He hadn't said so much as a word yet, and Remus knew how difficult that must be for him. So when they were finally in bed, and as alone as they could ever be at Hogwarts, he lay quietly on his back, and stared up at the velvet hangings, and let Sirius speak. I won't let her do this, Sirius whispered into his ear, reaching for his hands. I'll talk to her, Mary and Lily will talk to her, and will make her understand. McGonagall and Madame Pomfrey, they'll want to help you. She'll listen to them if she won't listen to her friends or Dumbledore and... James could kick her off the team, anything. We won't lose you, Mooney. You've worked too hard. You're not getting kicked out for just 
trying to be nice to that ungrateful, stuck-up intolerant is going to be okay, Padfoot, Rumor said. Exactly, Sirius nodded, his hair rustling against the pillow. Exactly, because we're going to stop her. No, I mean, it doesn't matter what happens. It's going to be okay. If I leave in three months, or if I have to go tomorrow, everything will be okay. But you're newts! Well, I was looking forward to completely destroying you in history and charms. And arithmancy. I've been copying off you all year. <laughs> and arithmancy. Remus laughed. But, well, the newts don't mean much. I still won't be able to enter any of the ministry training programs without registering as a werewolf, and I'm not going to do that. Not ever. I don't know if I even really want to do that sort of job. What I want is to start changing things. That's why I wrote to Danny in the first place. You mean, you want to get kicked out? I don't think it'll come to that. I don't think Marlene would, even if she's angry. But she might ask me to leave, and if that's what she wants, then I will. And join the war. Sirius finished. His voice sounded strange. Not bad, but Remus knew he understood. Yes, I suppose you could put it that way. Remus nodded. I'll come with you then. I don't need newts either. I'm a black. I wouldn't ask you to do that. I know. But I will. We'll go together. Remus didn't want to admit it, but he was quietly thrilled. Perhaps it was the Gryffindor part of him. But leaving childhood behind and rushing headfirst into the unknown with his best friend sounded so gloriously tempting. It would be the making of them, away from Hogwarts and schedules, on all of the silly little feuds and rivalries there. They had so much to offer, he knew it. Hadn't they triumphed in everything they'd ever attempted? Weren't they the heroes of every story so far? It would be nothing at all to them. They could end this war and really begin their lives. Thank you. He rolled over to kiss Sirius. He kissed his lips and his hands slid under his nightshirt and he kept kissing him, his lips, his neck, his jaw. Thank you, thank you. Chapter 145 Seventh Year, What We Lack Wednesday the 29th of March, 1978 The weekend passed quietly. There was homework to complete, and Quidditch to train for, and an enormously complicated prank to plan, and Marlene did not make any move in any direction. Sirius and James reported that she attended Quidditch practice, and played as well as she ever had, but hadn't spoken to them. Mary said she was still upset, but that she hadn't made up her mind on whether to tell or not. They were well into the next week by the time Marlene finally decided to approach Remus again. She caught him alone, which was rare these days. He was tidying up the charms classroom following a revision session just before the Wednesday inter-house prank planning cooperative meeting. Usually Chris helped, but he was down with a head cold and had taken the afternoon off. Remus had half wanted to call off the group altogether. It seemed so futile. Learning and learning and learning. For what? To pass an exam? Get a good mark? And then? If Greyback didn't kill him before he was twenty, then he would still be unemployable. But everyone seemed to like the study groups, and he hated letting them down. She entered the room, smelling of herbs from the greenhouse, rosemary and sage, and rich earthy soils. He turned, and unconsciously backed himself against a wall. Hello, he said. She stood still for a while, staring at him in total silence, before replying. Hello, I'm furious with you. I know, he nodded, trying to be understanding. I think that's fair enough. Um, are you, are you ready to talk about it? No, she shot, folding her arms. She glared at him, and he averted his eyes. He heard her fidget a bit, and sigh impatiently. <sighs> but Danny says I have to. Rumours consciously avoided smiling, but couldn't ignore the flood of relief he felt at those words. 
He looked up again carefully. You've spoken to him properly then? Yes. He said he tried the Merlap essence combined with Muggle TCP, and he's healing faster. And you, you were right about taking a sleeping draught. It's the best thing I've found for healing, Remus replied warily, averting his eyes again. She made him feel so ashamed of himself. Everyone knew except me, Marlene said. She was leaning against the opposite wall now, the whole room between them, the jumble of chairs and desks. Even Mary. She worked it out. I, I didn't tell her. I always thought you were weird because you were queer. He frowned a bit. Was he weird? He didn't say anything. He couldn't think of anything that would make it better. You really hurt my feelings, Remus, Marlene continued. You lied to me for years. I thought we were friends. I shared things with you I haven't told anyone else. We are friends, Remus protested. I'm your friend, anyway. He sighed heavily. Would it always be like this, when people found out? Look, I couldn't tell you. There were too many people involved. Madame Pomfrey and, and even Dumbledore. I had to keep it quiet for their sakes, too. And you've made it quite clear in the past how you feel about people like me. You should have told me. What would you have done? Remus was getting annoyed now. Complained? Told everyone? Got me expelled? I might not have. She bit her lip and looked away. The less certain she was, the more angry Remus grew. Well, I didn't much fancy taking the risk, he said. I haven't got a family or a real home to go to, in case you'd forgotten. I haven't got anything going for me outside of this school, so forgive me for doing anything I could to stay here. I understand that. She looked up quickly, reaching her hands out. And I never wanted to cause you any trouble, but Remus, can't you see how dangerous? I was eleven. I was only a kid. And this old man shows up and tells me I'm going to magic school. What would you have done? Don't shout at me, she frowned, shrinking a bit. I didn't come to shout. Sorry, he muttered. I didn't get my chance the other day. I'm sorry about that. Good. They were quiet after that, both looking at the ground, both fidgeting with their hands. Remus could hear Marlene's heart thudding in a steady, anxious rhythm. Look, he said, keeping his voice low and steady, unclenching his fists. If you want me to leave Hogwarts, then I will, as long as you promise not to get anyone else in trouble. I'm not going to put up a fight. But you're newts. They won't matter if you're going to tell everyone how dangerous I am. You sound like Danny. Quiet again. Rima shook his head, tired and exasperated. He tried a different tack. How is he now? The letter said he wanted to meet me. He's okay, she nodded, her eyes a bit bright. I think it cheered him up, knowing that someone else was going through the same thing. Yeah, Remus nodded. It's something I would have liked. James and Sirius and Pete, they've always made sure I never felt alone. So, I know how much of a difference it makes. Marlene nodded and wiped her eyes. I'm angry, she said, tiredly. But I don't know if I'm angry with you. You just... It was such a shock. And I'm not sure how many shocks I can take these days. He laughed, and he didn't really know why. She smiled weakly. I'm not going to say anything. I don't want you to go anywhere. Danny says... He says we need to focus on our similarities, not our differences, now more than ever. N Lily and Mary said the same. I know they're right, it's just harder than I expected. I can't have you hating me, he said warily. I don't hate you. Hating what I am is the same thing. 
I'm trying, Remus. She blinked away tears. I swear, I'll try. Thank you, he nodded. For a split second he was disappointed. He'd been so ready for a change, knowing he'd have to wait a bit longer, stung for a moment, but dissipated quickly, like a door closing. That was that. He would finish school and beat everyone in history, arithmetic too, probably, and watch the final Quidditch game and get too drunk celebrating with his friends. Greyback could wait. Can I help you with this? Marlene gestured at the messy classroom. Potter and Black and their gang will be here in a few minutes to plan their raid on Slytherin. Yeah, okay. Remus nodded, and they both began moving the desks. The confrontation seemed to be over, and for now they were both satisfied. He was glad. It had been awful not having Marlene as a friend. Remus and Chris usually used magic to move the classroom furniture back. But Marlene had never been good at locomotion spells, so she just started lifting and pushing things. Remus didn't want to show off now that they were back on tentative talking terms, so he did his best to match her. I'm going to talk to Mary, Marlene said suddenly, lifting a chair and pushing it under a desk. Yaz wants me to. I told Danny already. That's good, Remus smiled, encouragingly. I'm sure Mary will be fine. She's the least judgmental person I know. Yeah, you're probably right. Marlene watched him thoughtfully as he moved the final table back to place. Remus? Hmm? Is your limp because of the transformations? Am I limping? Remus stood a bit straighter, self-conscious. Sometimes more than others, she replied, matter-of-factly. I always thought, with your upbringing, that, well, someone did it to you. He shook his head. When I was thirteen or so, I think something clicked back into place a bit wonky. He shrugged. Gets a bit stiff now and then. I hardly think about it now. Hmm... She replied, looking thoughtful. How many times? The door flew open and Lily entered, looking furious, James trailing behind her. Peter and Sirius close behind, both smirking. We said no pranks until the end of term. We're supposed to be keeping a low profile. Your head boy! Come on, Evans, James said, hands out. That was nothing, barely even a prank. It was, um... He cast a pleading glance at Sirius. High spirits, Sirius supplied. High spirits, James nodded, grinning. All of the bathroom mirrors suddenly reflecting back troll faces is high spirits. Lily rounded on them both. It was no good. All three boys collapsed into peals of laughter. Remus sniggered too. He'd done half the research for that one. The week before... He'd spent hours searching through books of troll dynasty histories for portraits to get all of the features right. He'd hoped he'd get a chance to catch some of the reactions before Flitwick managed to break the glamour spell they'd used. (laughs) You nutters, Marlene smiled shyly. Marlene! Lily gasped. They all turned to look at her, and then to Remus, agape. He made a point of smiling back at them all, relaxing his shoulders and clapping his hands together. Come on then, this cooperative isn't going to run itself. Sirius still had some opinions about Marlene, of course. Remus refused to hear them. He wanted the matter closed. He wanted to move on. And he wanted to meet Danny, as soon as possible. For the first time, for better or for worse, Remus felt he had an ally out there, someone who was like him, on their side. He wrote another letter, then scrapped it and tried again, then again, and again, There was so much to say, and Remus wasn't sure where to start. What do you want to talk to him for, though? Sirius yawned one night in bed, as Remus gave up on another attempt to properly introduce himself. You know more about being a werewolf than he does. It's not as if he'll have any special insight. Uh, It's not really about that, Remus yawned back, putting his wand light out and lying down. He rubbed the knuckles and fingers on his right hand, 
Some days, he felt as if he never put his quill down. He was always writing, if not feverishly revising his notes for news, then making complex calculations in aid of the big prank, or writing to Grant, or Firox, or Danny. Well, wait until school's finished, then, Cyrus advised. It's safer for the both of you. There are three moons between now and then, Remus replied, trying to get comfortable. The sheets always ended up wrinkled in Sirius's bed. He had no idea how the other boy managed it. I know that, Sirius replied indignantly. But there's not much you can do, is there? Suppose not. And you don't owe him anything? No. Remus chose his words carefully. But... I owe it to myself to do the right thing, don't I? Is that what's got into your head? Sirius was frowning, Remus could tell. A flutter in his belly told him that they were heading for a fight, and he could avert it right now by just changing the subject. What do you mean, what got into my head? Remus snapped. When you wrote to Danny in the first place, you've got to admit it was a bit reckless. Excuse me. Well, for someone who spent seven years trying to keep every aspect of himself completely private, it was a bit bonkers just to go and send a letter to a stranger, my friend's brother, spilling your guts about everything. Not everything. But if it was all in the service of doing the right thing, then I suppose that's fine. Look, if you're pissed off with me, then just say so. This sarcastic crap doesn't suit you, Black. Remus rolled over onto his side. I'm not pissed off, Sirius said. Good. Remus knew that that wasn't the end of it. He waited, practically champing at the bit. I've just been thinking, that's all, Sirius said, finally. Remus smirked to himself before rolling back over, frowning. What? It's like you want to leave or something. Obviously I wanted to leave, Remus hissed, going in. I told you, it was pointless, me doing newts, pissing about with silly exams and clubs and pranks. When things are happening out there, right now, I had a chance to help and I took it. So what if I don't care about the consequences? Calling me reckless? I thought you'd understand. What happened to wanting to get back to your family? What happened to wanting to put a stop to it? I do want to, Cyrus said sounding smaller. Well, you're not acting like it. You seem more fussed about that stupid Quidditch match than the war. Maybe they're the same thing to you. Merlin, Sirius replied weakly. You don't stop until you've tasted blood, do you? Must be the wolf in me, Remus said shortly. He rolled over again and shut his eyes. End of chapter 145